Hello, everyone. Why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, welcome to The Current. Uh, this is the North Central Region Water Network's Speed Networking Webinar Series. I am Rebecca Power. I'm joining you from the University of Wisconsin. I will be your moderator, and I will be a presenter today. Uh, this, uh, the North Central Region Water Network is an extension-led collaboration among land-grant universities and our partners in 12 upper Midwestern states, and we are pleased to bring you another uh, episode of The Current. So today we are going to be talking about uh, getting to scale and successful watershed management. Uh, I will be presenting along with my colleague Amulia Rao. And uh, you can submit your questions for us uh, as we go through our presentation in the chat box. Uh, that chat box is accessible in the right hand corner of your screen. There's a little purple tab down there um, that has a little chat balloon. You can click on that. You should be able to write your questions in there. Uh, and we'll keep those questions until the end of our presentation and, and go through them one by one. Uh, if you are having any audio issues uh, through the computer and you need to call in, there is a phone in option. Uh, that option can be accessed by opening up the session menu, which is in the upper left corner of your webinar screen. And if you uh, poke around in that uh, upper left tab, uh, you should find an option that says you use your phone for audio. Uh, okay, let's go ahead and get started. So as I said, uh, I'll be uh, presenting today. I'm the director of the North Central Region Water Network and a water resource specialist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. And my colleague, Amulia Rao, is an evaluation and project specialist, uh, also based uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay, here's us uh, side by side here. Um, uh, we won't take a lot of time to look at our, our bios, but you can read those briefly uh, before we get into the presentation. And you can see our, our listserv there if you're looking for more information on, on water topics here in the North Central region. Oops. Sorry, I had a little delay there on my switching. Okay, so let's go on and uh, get into the, the matter at hand. It's getting to scale, uh, in successful watershed management. So uh, this presentation is a summary of a uh, report that I think a number of you uh, on the line have contributed to. Uh, we're very excited to bring you the results of this report. I think um, what you'll find is a lot of this information we already know, um, but we, what we did is we tried to compile it in a, in a new way uh, to summarize it to say, you know, how do we go from these small scale uh, successes that we see uh, across the upper Midwest and across the country really in watershed management to more, um, more coverage across the landscape, more watersheds that are, are being successfully uh, planned and prioritized and, and managed because we know we're not going to reach uh, our small scale goals or our large scale goals, um, uh, whether it's, you know, um, here where, where we're based, uh, harmful algal blooms here in the Ahar Lakes or hypoxia in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, we need ro more robust systems uh, and uh, more widespread systems for managing our watersheds. Um, and that, that link that you see uh, here in the, in the left is a link to the report on our North Central uh, Region Water Network website. With that, I, I just want to thank um, thank our advisory committee, uh, 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 Todd Ames, uh, formerly with the Great Lakes Healing Our Waters Coalition, uh, now with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources, Nick Brozovich and Kate Gibson, at the Doherty uh, Institute uh, at the University of Nebraska, uh, Lincoln, uh, Linda Prokopi from Purdue University, uh, Chad Watts, who is formerly at uh, CTIC, the Conservation Technology Information Center, and Roger Wolf at the Iowa Soybean Association, and many other uh, contributors. Uh, this is a, a complex uh, topic, and, and we tried to 
bring you important points from many, many different disciplines and, and facets of watershed management. And it uh, certainly took a village to do that. So thanks to everybody uh, that helped um, with this thinking. Okay, and that uh, with that, I will turn it over to Amulia. Hi everyone, good afternoon. Thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction. Um, I wanted to start with uh, reiterating what Rebecca had said, uh, said early on about our motivations for exploring this topic. Uh, so at this stage, as a community, we have a good understanding of what it takes to develop and also to implement successful watershed um, initiatives, uh, but they, these are still isolated cases of success, um, and uh, we haven't been able to um, collectively add all of this up to large-scale improvements in water quality specifically. Um, and now there are many reasons for this, but the one that we want to address with this paper and this effort is um, the issue of scalability. And um, so in simple terms, scaling up is taking uh, what we know and taking what we have learned about successful watershed management initiatives and systematically implementing them on larger scales um, in order to achieve broader um, impact, uh, again, specifically related to water quality. Um, now, the, the slide uh, that you're all seeing is the overview of the white paper that Rebecca and I wrote together. The link in the previous um, slide will take you to the full PDF. And uh, so in our paper, we start with um, defining successful watershed management. Uh, we talk a little bit about what it means to get to scale, um, how we conceptualize uh, the scalable unit for watershed management, uh, what the necessary elements are to be successful in scaling up watershed management, and we end with a section on how to operationalize uh, the scale up of watershed management. So this, again, a brief overview of the white paper and also the presentation today. All right, um, so successful watershed management. Uh, so I'll begin by setting the stage with what we really mean by successful watershed management. Um, and we thought it would be important to do this since there are different views in the community about what it means to be successful, um, what, what, you know, what does it look like and how is it measured. Um, so this is how we define successful watershed management in our paper. So it is a system that achieves water-related environmental, social, and economic goals in a designated time frame. Uh, and the goals in this time frame are agreed upon by a representative group of stakeholders. So we wanted to be um, on the same page with everyone about what we define success in watershed management as. All right, now to really understand what it means to get to scale, we started with a pretty broad literature review. Um, and we found that this concept of scaling up or getting to scale was most developed in the for-profit sector, the non-profit sector, and as well as the public health sectors. Um, and in that literature, the term scaling up refers to the expansion um, of an intervention. Now, this intervention can be a program, a technology, um, or a policy of some sort that has been proven to be effective um, and expanding it in order to reach larger populations and achieve broader, broader impact on a more transformative scale. Uh, now, to be clear, in the context of watershed management, we are not recommending that we simply take strategies from successful watershed management in initiatives and replicate them across the Midwest or across the country. Um, we know that that um, isn't feasible. Everything we've learned about watershed management so far uh, indicates that, that that isn't necessarily uh, a good strategy. So we recognize for uh, successful scaling up, um, the strategies need to be adapted to reflect uh, the physical and the social characteristics of the watersheds that you're working in. Um, and this is exactly what presented some of the unique challenges um, for our paper and for our discussion. Um, and we try in the paper to discuss all of these um, sort of challenges and present strategies in which to address them. Uh, the examples that you're seeing on the screen right now um, are those of successful scaling up in the for-profit and the health sector. So an example in the for-profit sector is fast food chains. You see some examples on the screen. Uh, they often start off with you know maybe one location in one city, and then they're scaled up across the country, and some of these across the world. Uh, the other example on the right hand side 
of your screen are from the public health sector. So uh, smoking cessation campaigns um, and drinking water campaigns are examples of uh, public health campaigns that have been scaled up um, across countries. All right. All right, so during our literature review, we found that scale-up examples from the public health sector were ones that most closely reflected the context, the complexities, and the concerns in watershed management. Um, so the scale-up model that we used is heavily influenced by models that were developed in the public health sector. So looking quickly um, at the model on the screen here, so you see that in this model on the left-hand left -hand side, the best practices already exist, and the same uh, could be said for watershed management initiatives. We already know quite a bit about what the best practices um, for successful watershed management are. Um, and then there's a new scale-up idea, and once these are in place, there are four phases in this model to scaling up an initiative. So the first is the setup. We have the second one, which is developing the scalable unit. The third, which is uh, testing the scale, uh, testing the scale up, and you know improving it based on what you've learned, and then finally going to full scale. Um, now, for this model to be effective, there need to be support systems in place. Um, so some examples that are presented here are learning and data management systems, and also the human capacity to execute um, the scale up. There also need to be mechanisms in place to cultivate leadership, for example, to promote communication. And one necessary condition is. Uh, the urgency and the persistence to address the problem. So this is an example, again, of a scale-up model from the public health sector. All right, now before we go into what this model look, looks like for watershed management, I want to take a step back and discuss our methodology. The concepts, the ideas that we present in our paper were developed using a combination of three methods. Uh, one I just mentioned, we did a thorough literature review. The second and maybe the most important one was a summit that we organized um, in late 2017. Uh, we invited um, experienced watershed professionals, so we had managers, researchers, educators, and so on, who spent two days uh, discussing this topic of scaling up. Um, and the ideas that were generated um, during that summit are ones that we present in our paper. Uh, the final is an expert review. So we had experts uh, review and provide feedback on the various draft versions of our paper, and then uh, their feedback was incorporated into the final version. All right, so I'm going to go back actually to the previous slide here. Um, and you, the, the second phase here, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, but the one that I'm pointing at is developing um, the scalable unit. Um, give me a second, I'm seeing a different slide. OK, all right, can everyone see the phases of scaling up slide? Yes, OK, excellent. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, the best practices in successful watershed management exist. We already know quite a lot about what they are. Um, now, this first phase is called the setup. Um, and this is what we attempted to do with this project and this effort. Uh, so developing a vision, developing a strategy uh, for how scale up can be implemented. The second phase um, that is described in this model is developing the scalable unit, uh, and this is what we'll be discussing next for the next few slides. Um, we then uh, talk in the paper about testing and evaluating the scale up and who really should be or could be in charge um, of doing this, and we propose. Um, Midwest Watershed Collaborative, we'll talk some more about this at the end. Um, and this uh, collaborative can also oversee the final step, which is uh, going to full scale. All right, um, so I'm going to talk a little more about this second, um, the second phase here. So let me move forward. All right, so what is Scalable unit. A scalable unit in the literature that we referenced is defined as a system um, or rather a microsystem that can be replicated as an intervention is scaled up. So this usually is an administrative unit of some sort and it includes both the infrastructure and the relationships that 
are likely to be present in the larger scales of the same system. Now, our first task was to describe what does this look like for watershed management? What is the scalable unit for watershed management? So this was the question, again, that we presented to our summit attendees when we met them a couple of years ago. Um, and they divided the scalable unit for watershed management into two distinct parts. As the first being scale appropriate planning, uh, prioritization and implementation, and the second part was necessary elements um, to support the scalable unit, or rather the necessary support elements for the scalable unit. So we'll look at both of these uh, parts really briefly here. And um, the first part again, watershed management, um, you know, involves planning, prioritization, and implementation. And our summit attendees recommended that watershed assessment, watershed prioritization, and some of the higher level watershed planning uh, could primarily be done at larger scales. And for most Midwest states, this would be the Huckett scale. Um, now, for more detailed watershed planning and watershed implementation, this can be done um, at smaller scales. And for most watershed, um, sorry, for most uh, Midwestern states, this would be the Huck 10 and the Huck 12 scales. Um, now, the reason I say most Midwestern states is that we recognize that. Uh, based on population, based on geography or governance systems in the different states and the different watersheds, um, there may be some flexibility in how this is implemented. And the second part um, of the scalable unit for watershed management um, includes four elements that need to be in place, and these are critical to support the scale up of watershed management at large, large scales. Um, and again, these four uh, support elements came up during our conversations um, at the summit. Um, and the categories of the four elements that were identified were human capital, social capital policy framework, and the finance framework. Um, I'm going to hand it off to Rebecca at this point to talk a little more um, about these four support elements and also about the operationalization. So I'm going to mute myself and I'll join you again when we get to the question and answer session. Great. Thanks, Amelia. And one thing I'll say here before I switch slides is um, uh, we know that uh, both of these elements is, we, you know, we tried to depict in this um, figure here that, you know, you need human capital, you need to organize human capital, you need social capital, you need to organize it, you need uh, policies and financing frameworks, both at the smaller scale and at the larger scale, and they need to be working together. Um, so uh, I think you can that was a little bit hard to, to depict in an image here, but we did the best that we could. Uh, and, uh, you know, you see that happening on a day to day basis. And we, that's just an important uh, part of how these necessary elements operate. OK, so human capital. Uh, so some of the things that we found, uh, you know, in talking uh, with many of you and um, the, the folks that were uh, participating in our, our working session. Uh, so this idea of a nested management structure corresponding to the scalable unit. So specifically, um, uh, a couple of the ideas that came out were, you know, at that Huck 8 scale, ha having a person that it is there uh, or, um, you know, a, a management structure that can look at that larger scale, at that Huck 8-ish, uh, scale and uh, also uh, people uh, at the smaller 10, 12 scales that are, are working together, uh, you know, to look at that assessment phase that's happening, assessment and prioritization that's happening at the larger scale, and to do the, the more detailed nine element type of planning uh, at the, the 10, 12 scale, and also that implementation that arises out of a nine element type plan uh, at the smaller scales. A second important element uh, when it comes to the human capital a part of watershed management is really nurturing watershed professionals and their leadership uh, by professionalizing watershed management in a variety of ways. So certainly providing uh, training that addresses the, the complex um, skill sets that are needed to, to be effective as a watershed coordinator or watershed manager. So those range from, you know, um, 
modeling and and watershed monitoring you know that's the a lot of the technical uh, recommending best management practices a lot of the technical uh, elements of watershed management to uh, organizational development meeting facilitation uh, fundraising you know there there are a lot of um, different potential skill sets that those folks need to have and we want to support them um, in, in uh, being trained uh, to to have those skills second um, uh, developing uh, some sort of professional certificates or certification uh, in watershed leadership um, so that could you know could be for volunteers or for uh, professionals uh, establishing professional organizations so really recognizing uh, what watershed professionals do like we do for a certified crop advisor or uh, like we do for um, uh, engineers you know uh, look just really elevating and recognizing what those folks do is an important profession and then offering professional level compensation and career ladders uh, for those watershed professionals you know, uh, you you all know uh, a number. You know, one of the challenges that we face in watersheds is that, uh, you know, once somebody is is in a watershed for a while, and they they develop those relationships, um, and and they they learn their job, and 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 then they leave uh, to go on to another position. And it's critical for our success to have people that will be willing to stay long term and to uh, maintain and grow those relationships and and build trust with the folks. Um, that are doing the, the on the ground management. Okay, so, uh, second in human capital, uh, encouraging citizen leadership and participation in watershed initiatives, uh, which uh, could include um, programs like here in Wisconsin, we have a, a producer led watershed protection grants uh, in. Iowa, of course, Iowa Soybean Association has been a leader in um, growing uh, farmer leadership and watershed management, as has Iowa State Extension. Um, and there are a num number of other examples uh, cropping up of, of uh, supporting farmer leaders, as well as other kinds of citizen leaders that uh, have been active uh, for a longer, you know, we, we've um, recognized them as, as being more watershed leaders uh, over you know, the past 10, 20 years. Uh, and second, uh, in, in training and nurturing system integrators and liaisons, those people are that are bridge builders that are, you know, able to um, bring people together around watershed issues. Um, one of, a couple other pictures here. We, so we have River Network that's provided a lot of training uh, for, uh, you know, watershed um, people active in, in watershed management over time, as have a number of uh, extension-led watershed academies, uh, including the Indiana Watershed Leadership, Leadership Program, pictured here. I have to learn to click on the slide more quickly so, so we don't delay. Okay, um, social capital. So this is the next necessary element. So, um, you know, uh, bridging up from the individual, of course, involving community members in watershed-related planning activities and decisions. So folks that may not have water as their highest priority, but are, are community leaders or, um, uh, you know, pillars of the community in other ways, involving them in, uh, in watershed-related planning and decision-making. Uh, increasing social capital by strengthening networks, you know, that's, you know, we, so we need the people and the human capital that provide that bridging function, and then we need the activity that actually builds those bridges. Involving community and formal organizations like community watershed associations, and then, um, you know, thinking about in the prioritization process, thinking about community readiness and the social component of community readiness, and prioritizing projects not just based on, you know, the the pollutant loading that's coming from that project or the willingness of landowners, a uh, single landowner to participate, but uh, prioritizing where there, there maybe is a, a community sense of, of readiness uh, to um, do great work in watershed management. Um, and just emphasizing this building trust component a little bit more. Um, yeah, using early engagement, uh, reciprocity, like if you know, we'll do something for you if you do something for us. 
uh, making sure there's clear and transparent uh, communication and, and processes when it comes to watershed planning and implementation. Uh, as much data transparency is, and sharing uh, as is possible while still maintaining uh, the privacy of, of landowners and land managers. Uh, again, we know that's a delicate balance, but uh, thinking about systems uh, to do that well. And then managing uh, expectations. You know, it took us a while in, in some cases to get to the situation that we're in um, with um, our watersheds where there are impairments and uh, being clear, you know, it may be a 10 year, uh, 10 year time frame, it may be a 20 year time frame before we're really um, seeing those environmental results that we're hoping to see. Okay, next, uh, policy framework. So this is the third uh, necessary element that we wanted to highlight. So uh, what we're proposing is that uh, states uh, in partnership with federal and local governments must develop policies to encourage watershed planning at large scales and implementation at smaller local scales. So we're just um, carrying over that scalable unit idea and saying, you know, we really need to develop policies uh, and, and programs, uh, particularly at the state level, but in partnership with, you know, across scales that um, mirror that scalable unit idea where we have larger scale um, assessment and prioritization processes and smaller scale implementation, uh, smaller scale, more detailed planning and uh, implementation. Um, the, the Minnesota One Watershed, One Plan system is probably the closest that we found to a system that does this. Um, there, you know, we're all um, trying to build this plane as we're flying it. So different different states have have different elements of this idea in place. But uh, we felt like the Minnesota One Watershed, One Plan um, system was probably the closest to this idea that we found. Watershed policies need to incorporate outcome based numeric performance measures. This is not a new idea. Um, uh, similarly, water plans must include accountability criteria and federal, state, and local watershed efforts must be coordinated and corresponding agencies should work together synergistically. Um, and, you know, uh, one of my colleagues, I said, you know, I said, do we really need to say that about the coordination? And she said, yes, you need to, we need to say that. And, uh, uh, you all know there are discrepancies between policies between state agencies, federal agencies, and local governments that um, can sometimes impede our progress in watershed management. So just the, the more that we can continue to sync those up, the better. Um, we realize we're not going a lot of detail on some of these ideas. And again, there's more detail in each of these points uh, in, uh, in the report itself. Okay, so the, the financing framework, again, a critical uh, element of successful watershed planning. And we're seeing a lot of rewiring when it comes to these financing frameworks right, right now. It's very exciting. Um, so just broadly, you know, you think about this financial framework like you think about your own financial portfolio, right? So, you know, we, we need enough money. <laughs> we need the, the money uh, to be uh, relatively stable over time. And part of that stability means having that money come from diverse uh, sources. So just that's an overarching, like think about those three things as you're thinking about um, what a financing framework uh, means for you in, in successful watershed management. So four key points here, exploring new and underutilized public and private funding sources to pay for watershed projects. And we'll get into a little bit more detail on each of these in a minute. Um, increasing the use of financing mechanisms. So um, state revolving loan funds where, where there's, you know, you're, it's a loan, uh, not just a grant, um, and green bonds that offer flexible ways uh, to borrow money and typically lower interest rates um, than we see, um, it, you know, it's with some other loan uh, financing mechanisms. Next, increasing use of incentive-based and mitigation-based economic instruments um, that can be used to modify land management through more of um, market-type systems. And then finally, uh, building organizational capacity that will allow uh, 
uh, watershed efforts to pursue underutilized sources of private funding. So, and, and you know, uh, get that sufficient, stable, and long-term and diverse set of funds uh, together. You know, building our capacity to be able to do this work because there's a lot of new. Um, and it, there's a lot of innovation going on right now and just helping uh, people stay up to s speed with what the options are and which options will work best for their particular situation. So let, let's uh, look at uh, this new and underutilized funding sources portion of the financing work. So again, uh, so two particular types uh, stay, we, we highlighted were stable long-term public funding sources and underutilized private funding sources. So, and I, I want to emphasize, I think it's um, critical. We didn't see any examples where this of successful watershed management where this wasn't the case. Where you know, we want to have a stable long-term public funding source that underpins what we do in watershed management because water ultimately is a, is a public good. Uh, so, you know, what mechanisms, and, and that's not to say that uh, public funding is ever going to fund or ever fund everything that we need to do with watershed management, but there should be that underlying stable public funding source. So ballot measures, um, like the, the Minnesota legacy funds, the three-eighths of 1% uh, tax that uh, Minnesotans levied on themselves, to support uh, clean water, um, the arts, and other environmental type projects. Uh, that, um, that's an example of a, a stable long-term public funding source. There are other states that have these in place, and we have a map uh, in the report that shows you uh, states that have those types of programs in place, so you can look at the different types of programs. Uh, the and an, another example is special assessment districts like Nebraska has their natural resource districts and most states have examples of these types of special assessment districts um, that address uh, watershed management. Soil and water conservation districts in some cases are an example of this as well. And underutilized uh, private funding sources uh, like like impact investing. So um, we're gonna get into the green bonds in a minute, but that impact investing um, is just where, where investors are willing to uh, uh, put money into the pool, uh, whether they're getting a market return on their investment or not, but they, they want to invest uh, in uh, socially, environmentally uh, responsible ways, um, and those private funding sources are, are just becoming more and more common. Okay, underutilized financing mechanisms. So this is where uh, this is not. Um, th this is where definitely you know the the funder is looking for a return on their investment. So it's a loan, and they're they're looking for a return. State revolving loan funds are, are one example of of a, a financing mechanism that a, a lot of us in water are familiar with. So. Um, Ohio, you know, uh, is using their state revolving funds to also support uh, uh, non-point source work, and um, DC Water is, you know, one of the most well-known uh, green bonding initiatives. Uh, green bonds are, are tax-exempt bonds. Um, in 2016, there was over a hundred billion dollars of green bonds issued, so that this is becoming a larger and larger. Uh, funding source. Now, of course, not all that hundred uh, billion was for water-related green bonds, but um, uh, certainly water is one of the places that we're seeing this take place. So, uh, the benefit of of, uh, of putting putting in place a green bond is that you are able to attract new capital, you know, new investors that are interested in this kind of investing. Um, some of the downsides, you know, you have additional reporting requirements to demonstrate that environmental impact, and also it's just a you know a learning curve in putting these types of uh, bonds together and the contracting um, and um, accountability around these green bonds. And I've, we've got a couple of links here to to resources for you. Okay, and then finally, other underutilized economic instruments. So, 
incentive uh, incentive based approaches. Uh, so you know, utilizing uh, market uh, forces to change behavior in some ways. So uh, one example of this is uh, insurance premium discounts. Like uh, I think it was 2017 that Iowa, the Department of Ag and Land Stewardship. Um, was supporting crop insurance premium discounts uh, for uh, use of cover crops. So one way to you know get over the the nervousness and potential challenges of um, of utilizing a new practice while recognizing you know the soil health benefits, the erosion control benefits uh, that can be realized from a new new kind of practice. Uh, and then uh, mitigation or credit-based approaches. So, uh, you know, we have some examples of mitigation or credit-based approaches in the report. And, you know, so um, uh, there are a number, again, of those types of approaches that are cropping up uh, in the Midwest and uh, um, different examples of, of how those can look, like water quality trading. Um, here in Wisconsin, we have the Watershed Adaptive Management Option, which is is not training, but uh, which is which is not trading, but it's a way of it's a new uh, economic instrument for point sources and non-point sources to work together to um, to address uh, phosphorus pollution in our case. Um, permitting responsible mitigation. So we've you know done wetland uh, wetland mitigation for a long time. It's a mechanism you may all be familiar with, and um, also in lieu fees. So in a development situation, you know, where a developer is not able to mitigate their impact right on site, um, paying into a pool to have that mitigation occur uh, on a different site. So, okay, so that was a quick run through. Um, and as Amelia said, okay, so, you know, so this is a, a potential way to think about the, the type of, um, you know, to the, the scalable yield the, the the widget that we are all looking to sell more broadly and looking to have more broadly in water management. So we've laid out a case for you. Um, and where so where do we go from here? So we uh, what we've tried to do with this this paper and in the conversations we've had with many of you is create a vision and a broad strategy for the for the scale up. Next, uh, we think it would be valuable to develop some kind of organizational structure to support scale up. So we're thinking, well, um, you know, we just called it uh, the Midwest Watershed Collaborative for the purposes of starting the discussion. Um, we recognize that the, you know, when you look at step three here, we recognize that we're we're putting out this framework as a uh, you know, something that will be. Uh, challenged and changed uh, over time, and we want it, you know, tested and evaluated, and and welcome uh, modifications and, and revisions to really make sure that we we are all thinking about what that what that widget is and communicating about what it will take to actually uh, get to scale um, and having a common framework to communicate to the folks that fund watershed management um, and write, you know, policy um, to think like, yes, these are the these are the necessary elements that we need. So we want to make sure to continue to test, evaluate, and refine. And then, you know, hopefully over time, uh, get to that, uh, you know, the, as full scale uh, of watershed management, successful watershed management systems as we can get in the Midwest. All right. So um, this is just a quick uh, scheme of you know what we've done, what we've you know what we've done to date, uh, and uh, where we really think we need to build now, which is where those stars are, developing those support systems and, and adoption uh, mechanisms, as well as that that testing and evaluating that we talked about uh, earlier. So this idea of a Midwest Watershed Collaborative. So what you know what could this type of group do? Um, so we could use, you know, this this type of group to develop common knowledge management systems around watershed management. Um, so, you know, within agencies, within NGOs, within universities and extension, uh, soil and water conservation districts, other local government uh, entities, um, 
farmers, uh, farm, you know, agricultural professional organizations, municipalities and utilities, you know, that whole group of folks it takes uh, to get watershed management done. Um, the collaborative cultivate new leadership in, in watershed management, so growing new leaders uh, that uh, can advocate for successful watershed management and scaling up of successful watershed management. It could organize outreach campaigns uh, to get to that scaling up, uh, influence policy, and provide technical and, and financial expertise. So really like a, a community of practice uh, as well as uh, broader scale implementation around watershed management. So. Uh, with that, thank you. And Amulia, did you have anything to add in summary before we get to questions? I don't think I have anything uh, to add, Rebecca, but I think uh, we have some good questions here and that'll help clarify um, some of what we were talking about. Great, thank you. Okay. So, um, and and Gary, just you know, we've we've had that question about PDFs um, a couple of times now in our sessions. So I'm thinking, uh, just or that that's something we ought to think about uh, doing in the future is having these PDFs available um, as quickly as possible for you all. So just note that we see that and we hear you. Um, while we don't have the PDF for you now of the presentation, um, we certainly will uh, think about getting that out to people in the future. So Andrew, uh, when establishing human capital for watershed management, did you find there was a limited there was a limit to the number of watershed plans that can be implemented consistently at the same time? Um, that's a so that's a great question. We didn't. Uh, what we've seen is that of course it is funding related, um, and so we did. I wouldn't say there was a specific limit, but we know, of course, where we see states that have more resources, they are willing to say, you know, um, we're going to establish a system where we're going to be in, you know, we're going to have an assessment for every HUC 8, uh, and within that, we're going to, we're going to prioritize, you know, a, a HUC, um, uh, a finer scale plan like nine element planning and implementation in a HUC 10, 12, Area, so you know, I think what we're what we're hoping is that there's some sort of statewide system that every state has for some kind of assessment and, and implementation. But we we didn't see. I mean, what we saw is that funding, of course, was a limit. But um, you know, I don't think there's any inherent systemic limit that we saw. Uh, okay, and is the number scale of watershed plans play a key role in how well uh, they can be how well they can be implemented over time yes absolutely um, next question from Walsh County so uh, conservation district in North Dakota a lot of our money is coming from 319 grants do you know of any other stable financial support that a watershed can pursue <laughs> perfect okay so we helped answer your question great and Martin can state revolving loan state revolving fund loans be used for non infrastructure projects so um, and also since state revolving funds are linked to um, uh, clean water uh, loan program there is a size there is a size of utility restrictions to them so Martin um, that in some states state revolving fund um, loans it's called a sponsorship component to the state revolving fund loans that can be used for non-point source projects um, Ohio is one of those states Iowa is one of those states um, that does um, you allow uh, non-point uh, state revolving fund state revolving loan funds to be used for non-point source uh, projects so you can check out like the you know the report has examples um, that you can take a look at. Martin, I've also just pasted in the chat box the EPA. They have like a one pager, or maybe it's a two pager, um, that introduces people to sponsorship lending um, and the loan funds. So I put in the link there if you want to quickly check it out. Thank you, Amelia. And yes, an EPA has been really helpful in um, just helping uh, people think about. Uh, 
how this type of program might be used um, in states beyond where it's already being used. Sorry about that. I was I was still on mute. Um, so Andrew asks, did your assessment evaluate the total estimated cost of watershed plans and compare to currently available funding sources for plan implementation? Um, and if there were any trends in funding shortfall, we did not look at that um, across the upper Midwest. I think, or, or you know, across the the North Central region where we were looking. I think we were um, making the case of what it would take to get to what we would consider to be a successful watershed management model and saying let's you know let's put that out there and see what it would take uh, to get this done and again understanding that there needs to be a mix of public and private funding sources and we're seeing a lot of innovation about how to couple those funding sources to get the job done i think you know there's a lot of there's a lot of money out there um, it's where it's being spent and how it's being spent um, and potential you know barriers to linking up public and private funds so so but your um, your question points to a great uh, area of, of potential evaluation um, Andrew I went in and uh, put in the link for the conservation finance network we have and like Rebecca said we didn't do the assessment of you know how much more funding is needed to go where we want to be uh, but organizations like the Conservation Finance Network do, um, if I'm not wrong, uh, there are some assessments on their website um, that, that get to what you're trying to have answered here. Um, I, I can't send you a specific link to the article. I'm not sure where I read it, but it, it, it was on this website. So I put the link in there for you to take a look. Thanks, Amelia. <clears throat> okay, Les. Uh, one Watershed One Plan in Minnesota is too frequently trying to paste together county-based organizations through watershed level agreements, but does not provide a focused leadership center for financing. Watershed district formation meets resistance from county governments. Any suggestions? So uh, certainly having those relationships clearly defined up front um, is is really important um, and establishing that foundation of trust is also important and and having the rules agreed upon uh, can help to build that trust now uh, all of our states are coming from different histories and and different you know there's there's a lot going on there less as you well you well know but that um, th that you know agreeing ahead of time on what the relationships are uh, making sure there's uh, that power is shared. You know, that's a lot of what we've heard is our barriers to these kinds of arrangements is the the um, concern about giving up power. And and we know that you know watersheds cross uh, district boundaries, they cross county boundaries, they cross state boundaries, and this is um, just something we've. I think we've got to do the work and we've, we've got to uh, figure it out. But that sort of rule, um, you know, getting the boundaries and the rules clear ahead of time and doing the hard work to are the two most important things that uh, we heard that I think could help, um, you know, bridge uh, local, you know, political districts across watersheds. And a question from Nancy. Hello, Nancy. Uh, did you assess the use of the Basin Report Card development process to evaluate success of watershed planning? Um, Amulia, I'm not remembering uh, using the Basin Report Card. Do you? Uh, no, we, we, this is a new resource. I just clicked on the link, uh, but we did not look at uh, this tool. So thank you, Nancy, you are always resourceful. Thank you for um, sharing that with us and we will definitely take a look. 
Okay. Um, other questions uh, from our participants? Okay, hearing hearing none, um, feel free in those, our last few minutes to type one in if you think of one. But uh, uh, thank you to all of you for being here, and, and thanks, Amulia, for uh, your hard work on this project as well. Um, and I'm noticing that Sid is something while I'm participating, while I'm getting to this last slide. Uh, thank you, Sid. So. Uh, you can uh, visit our, our website, uh, northcentralwater.org, to access this presentation and other, uh, other webinar archives. And we're going to have to think hard about whether to put these uh, PDFs of the, the slides up as well, as, a, as, as, well as the, the Collaborate session here. Uh, and our upcoming sessions, we have the North Central Climate Collaborative webinar, April 22nd. Uh, understanding and interpreting climate outlooks, and you can register at their website, northcentralclimate.org, uh, slash webinars. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, the couple of you that have said that you'll follow up, I look forward to talking to you. Um, thank you so much, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone.